take the cell base and hold it upside down so that the external threads are facing up. Next, install a stainless steel contact screw into one of the holes furthest from the threads. Tighten the screw until it bottoms out, but be careful not to tighten beyond this point or else the threads may be damaged. If you have a bright light behind your head, you should be able to see the screw emerge through the pinhole in the bottom of the cell base. Install the other two contact screws in the remaining upper holes. The three pins provide some redundancy in case part of the working electrode delaminates during your experiment. Next, install a spring-loaded pin into each of the holes in the bottom of the cell base. The pins should protrude upwards from the surface. Check the spring action by depressing each pin. It should compress easily and extend as soon as pressure is removed. If a pin falls to the bottom of a hole, tap the cell base on a hard surface to dislodge the pin. Then tighten the contact screw some more and reinstall the pin. Check the electrical contact between each pin and its corresponding stainless steel screw. This is easily done by measuring the resistance with a multimeter. The resistance should be under 10 ohms. If there is no electrical contact, remove the pin and screw and blow some compressed gas through the hole to dislodge any foreign material which may be preventing contact. While depressing each pin with a finger, install a nylon screw into the lower hole. This screw will hold the pin in place during the remainder of the assembly. The next step is to install the aluminum flange. If you like, you may install PTFE tape on the threads to provide some resistance against loosening. If you choose to use PTFE tape, wrap it around the threads in a clockwise direction as viewed from the bottom of the cell base. Place the lower o-ring into its groove. Look across the bottom of the cell base at a grazing angle and make sure that the o-ring protrudes from the cell base and that the flange is flush with the bottom of the cell base. Flip the cell base over and install the upper o-ring. Screw the glass cell body into the base until it bottoms out and seals against the o-ring. Only a small amount of torque is required to seal the cell. Do not tighten any more than one eighth of a turn after the point where you begin to feel resistance. Next, the face angle crystal can be installed into the crystal holder. The face angle crystal should already be coated with a conductive film before installing it into the crystal holder. The angled faces should be visible through the cutouts beneath the holder. Place the entire assembly into the VMAX top plate with the faces of the crystal towards the left and right sides of the plate. Place six screws into the flange and fasten the cell base to the top plate. Using your fingers, tighten each of the screws until the slightest resistance is felt. Verify that the cell is flat against the crystal and not wedged as is shown here. Then, working in a star pattern, finger tighten each screw. If using a wafer cell base, the first step is to select a wafer. Two different wafers are available. The first type of wafer has a face angle of 35.3 degrees, which can be identified by the triangular shape at the end of its grooves. The other wafer has a face angle of 54.7 degrees, and this version can be identified by the square profile at the end of its grooves. After selecting a wafer, place it groove side down in the wafer holder and place the entire assembly into the top plate. The grooves can be oriented parallel or perpendicular to the beam path. And in most cases, either orientation should work approximately equally well. Take extra care when fastening the cell if using wafers, as they are quite delicate. Tightening the screws by hand is sufficient. Take care not to over tighten. If there is a leak, you can always tighten the screws a bit more, but if the wafer breaks, you'll have to start over with a brand new wafer. Loosen the nylon pin retaining screws to allow the pins to extend and make contact with the working electrode. It's a good idea to test the electrical contact at this point by measuring the resistance between two stainless steel screws. When attaching the ground glass joints, wet the surfaces with millipore water. This helps them to seal and also prevents the joints from seizing. First, insert the stopcock into the reference arm. Make sure that the stopcock is open. Attach the reference arm to the main cell body and secure it with the spring. Grab the top plate and tilt the cell towards the reference arm. Fill the cell with electrolyte through the top port until the desired level is reached, then close the stopcock. The level of electrolyte in the reference arm should be slightly higher than the level in the main cell body. Note that the stopcock is kept closed at all times when using the J1 cell. The wetted ground glass surfaces of the stopcock provide a conduction path while mitigating chloride ingress into the main cell body. Next, install the top cap with the ports. The long bubbler should go in the port indicated by a glass nodule. The short bubbler and the gas trap are installed next. 
Finally, the counter electrode is installed, and the reference electrode is placed in the reference arm. After fully assembling the cell, it's a good idea to test it for leaks before installing it on the VMAX. Attach purge gas lines to the glass bubblers and gently flow some inert gas through the short bubbler to purge the headspace. The flow rate should be adjusted so that 1 to 2 bubbles per second can be observed through the gas trap. Next, turn on the flow to the long bubbler. Purge for at least 5 minutes and lift up the top plate to make sure that the bench top underneath is still dry. Now you are ready to proceed with your experiment.